Let's open our Bibles tonight to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again when he bringeth in the firstborn into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son, unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Skip down to chapter 2 now and begin reading also with verse 1. Therefore, after talking about his son, talking about how Jesus Christ was made flesh, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Of course, our text will be in verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? It's amazing to me how people can make a profession of faith and say that they're saved and then proceed to live as though somehow salvation was a right that they were entitled to or that, you know, God sure was lucky to save me and get all of my talents. I, I, I'm just, I marvel that there are people who believe that. Anytime I begin thinking about the wonders of God, anytime I begin thinking about the salvation of God, I feel so low and so undeserving that, that I just marvel that God would have ever saved me. Anytime I think about preaching on the wonders of God, including His salvation, I feel so literally inadequate that many times I actually would rather skip a message than to try to preach it and make a mess of exalting the greatness of God. I think the idea of salvation is one of those things that we really don't stop and appreciate. 
I can't even begin to tell the greatness of God. All of the books of theology that have ever been written can only scratch the surface of the majesty and the honor and the glory of God. When they write about salvation, you know, they can put it in fine, fancy theological terms. They can put it in words that explains it to them. But have you ever tried to understand what's involved in our salvation? I want to share a few thoughts. And I hope and pray that the Word of God will take the words beyond my ability to speak and that the Holy Spirit will use these words to prick your minds and your thoughts and get you to think about so great a salvation. Now, in the context, obviously, I read chapter 1 talking about how that Jesus Christ came to earth and, and how he was made lower than the angels and all of that. And all of that will play into the message. But the question that was asked if how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What makes our salvation great? And I have a total of five things. I'll go through them quickly, I hope. Five things that I came up with, there's many more, but five things that I believe makes our salvation so great. Salvation. Number one, our salvation is great because it was God that chose me. You know, we often think that it, you know, it's great to be chosen from some, for some great honor or some great position. When I was in elementary, junior high, high school, I was always, even in our community, if we had a, a pickup game of baseball or softball, I was always the very last one chosen. Nobody ever wanted me on their team. While everybody else was out playing ball, I was inside competing for the math team. You know, I was on the math team and the debate team and the speech team. But nobody ever wanted me on the sports team. But I'm thankful that somebody wanted me. Somebody wanted me so badly that in eternity, God chose me before the foundation of the earth, before I had ever been a thought in my mom and dad's mind, before I had ever been born, before I had ever done anything, God chose me. He chose me. I think about my life particularly and what a great honor it's been to have been chosen in some things of life. I'm thankful that I chose my wife. I'm thankful that God chose this church for us. I'm thankful that God has, has chosen me to do a lot of things. I'm thankful that God... <coughs> <clears throat> has blessed our printing outreach like he has. All of that is great and wonderful, but the thing that blows my mind is why on earth would God choose me? And yet, he did. And the fact that he chose me out of unborn millions and billions of people, God chose me, means that the salvation he gives me is very precious, very great. 
I had not even been born. In fact, the earth and heaven had not even been created. And yet God in eternity chose me. To think that the God chose me to be part of his family defies the imagination. And I can only say it has to be, it is, it must be a great salvation in order for God to reach down and save me. Number two, it's great because of who it was that gave salvation. Now I'm learning, and, and, and like I said this morning, I'm a slow learner. But I'm learning that a homemade card written with crayon from a grandchild is more valuable than a computer generated from some credit card company somewhere. I'm learning that who gives the gift sometimes makes it more valuable than the gift itself. Let's think about who it was that gave us that gift. I think all of you probably have some things that you value and, and, and value as very special because of who it belonged to. I have, very few people know this, I have the accordion that my dad used to play. He was actually very good playing it, never, never had one music lesson, couldn't, wouldn't know a C from a G on the bar, he didn't know one note from the other. But he was in Germany stationed in the army and he didn't smoke but he got two packs of cigarettes a month and he traded two packs of cigarettes for an accordion and he took it home and had no idea what it was but he began tinkering with it and he got to where he could play just about any song you wanted 100% by ear. I've got his accordion. If you put it on eBay, I don't know that it would be worth a whole lot. But it's worth a whole lot to me because that was my dad's. I can remember as a young child, dad, you know, in the living room playing the accordion. And, hey, how about a verse of this? And hum it a little bit. You would hum it. He would start playing. Never had one lesson at all. That's special to me because of who, who I got it from. There's a few things that I wouldn't sell for any amount of money because of where they came from. I've rescued a lot of things from the garbage bag because my wife thought it was trash. She didn't understand the, the hidden value because it was trash for all practical purposes, but it was where it came from, whose it was, what it meant that made it valuable. Well, you know who gave me salvation? God Almighty gave me the gift of salvation. The creator of the universe. The God who simply said, let it be, and it was. The God said, let there be, and it happened. The God who filled the universe with His presence. The God that is omniscient and knows everything. The God who created heaven and created the angels to worship Him. The God who controls every drop of rain 
And every snowflake, every blade of grass, the God who controls the heart of the king, the God who rules the universe, that God lowered himself to give me the greatest gift of all time. My nephew was in the Marine Corps and he was one of those, he went up through the ranks very quickly, very gifted young man. He rose to the position that he was in charge of, of securing the penthouse, uh, I'm sorry, the Pentagon at night. When everybody left, he was in charge of securing the Pentagon. He got sent to, he was in charge of security at one of the embassies of America. And while he was at the embassy, the President of the United States decided to go visit that particular embassy where he was. And being in charge of security, he was in his dress blues, and I mean, he was spick and span, and the President of the United States, the Secretary of State, and I forget who the other person was, went through and they took a picture of him shaking hands with the President of the United States. Well, you know what? I shook hands with something far greater than the President. I received a gift from the God who created everything. That makes it great. That makes it so great a salvation. For years, I had a pin that I wore. Um, it was given to me. And, and when, when I lost it here at church one Sunday, it fell off. I, I practically cried for a week because I knew that pin was irreplaceable. I knew that I would never, ever get another pin like that. What was it worth? I don't know. It was made of gold. I'm sure it was probably worth a little bit. But it wasn't what it was worth monetarily. It was valuable because of who gave it. And I still keep saying, God gave me something better than a lapel pen. I'm still looking for it, by the way. It's, I, I keep thinking it's got to be here somewhere. It's been a year. We haven't found it. But it was precious. It was valuable because of where it came from and who gave it to me. Do you ever think how special you are that God, God of the universe, reached down in time, reached down with love and lifted you personally? Not, not some bum, not some... You know, general, this is God reached down and pulled you out of the miry clay and gave you salvation. And then we act like we deserved it somehow. Number three, it's so great a salvation because of what it cost. You know, we've been trained and we often think of something as being valuable based on how much it cost. I had a preacher friend years ago who, uh, I started to tell a story on him, but I better not because he might listen to it on, on the internet. But you ladies, would you rather have a diamond ring or a grain of sand? Now, if you say a grain of sand, we're going to call the life squad and have you checked out. You know, a diamond ring is valuable. What makes it valuable? Why, well, it's a diamond ring. I, I heard on the radio, somebody made a really put things in perspective. It was um, Dave Ramsey. He's on at night, one of the local stations. And I happened to be listening to him and... Some guy called in and, you know, was asking some questions. And Mr. Ramsey said, 
well, how much is your house worth? And he gave him some astronomical number. And he said, how do you know it's worth that much? Have you tried to sell it for that? Well, no, but that's what I think it's worth. And, and he made this statement. Anything is only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. You may have a million dollar house, but if nobody's willing to give you more than a hundred thousand, it's only worth a hundred thousand. How much was our salvation worth? It was worth the eternal son laying down his life. See, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God. And in order to pay for salvation, in order to redeem lost men, God gave up the ultimate sacrifice. He gave up the most supreme price. He gave up the life of His own Son, the most precious thing He had, in order to buy salvation for you and me. Jesus left His throne in heaven. In heaven, Jesus was worshipped continually by the angels. We see in Isaiah that the angels there cried, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty! And yet, our salvation was so precious that Jesus Christ left all of that worship, left His throne in heaven, left the streets of gold, left everything that He had from eternity and came to earth because our salvation was so precious and so valuable that He was willing to give the utmost price His own life. He endured the physical sufferings for you and I. Now I know there was a movie made a few years back. I never did get around to watching it. And it was supposed to show all of the sufferings of Christ. And I'm sure that I, I did talk to a number of people that saw it. And it was very graphic from what I hear. Very very perhaps real life in what was involved in a Roman scourging. He was beaten. He was crowned with thorns. He was humiliated. They hung him on a cross naked for all the world to see his shame and to reproach him. But that was only part of what he endured. See, we see the physical suffering and we read, you know, that while there he paid the eternal hell for me. And we think, oh, that was terrible. But we always go back to the physical. You know, when we think, oh, he paid my hell and, and, and we go back to he was beaten and he was you know, all of those things. That was, the physical part was only a minor part of what Jesus suffered. In fact, the guy that directed the movie, produced the movie, was arrested shortly after for DUI and all kinds of other things. I don't think any of us, no matter how hard we try, can understand that the physical suffering was only a very small part of it. The majority of his suffering was that which he endured internally when God turned his back on him, when God poured not just physical suffering, but God poured eternal hell upon his son 
and his son suffered there on the cross the equivalent of me burning in hell forever and forever. You cannot describe that physically. I don't think any of us can understand that. And yet my salvation was so great and so precious that Jesus Christ endured my hell so that I could have so great a salvation. There are no words in our language that can describe the agony. You know, we read, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Oh, that must have been terrible. We read that the sun was darkened and he hung in total darkness for a while. And oh, that must have been horrible. But listen, he suffered the equivalent of you burning in hell forever. You can't do that with physical suffering. See, other people were also crucified. Crucifixion was a very common thing in Rome at that time. So it wasn't the fact that he was crucified that makes our salvation great. That was necessary, but it wasn't what made our salvation great. It wasn't because he was beaten, because lots of people had been beaten. But it was the fact that God in that hour, in those hours of darkness, poured such agony on Jesus Christ for my hell and your hell that God darkened the sun because he didn't want anybody seeing what the suffering. Everybody saw the beating. Everybody saw his back bleeding. But when God would pour our hell upon him, God darkened the sun because no man could see and understand and appreciate what God was doing to purchase our salvation. How we can take that salvation that cost so much and treat it so lightly. Number four, our salvation is great because it came with exceeding great and precious promises. I don't watch it anymore, but because I don't have time, but I used to years ago, I would watch The Price is Right. Have you, have you ever watched The Price is Right? I, I, I don't know that you could pay me enough money to get up there and act like an idiot like some of those people act. But you know, they'll come bring them up on stage and here's your prize and it's a couple of pieces of luggage. Oh, woo, woo, you know. And then it's like, oh yeah, luggage, luggage. And then they come out with this new car. And then they come out with this all expense trip paid to Hawaii. And then they come out, you know, we think salvation is great. And it is, but salvation's only the luggage. After we're saved, we have exceeding great and precious promises. We have the promise of forgiveness. I, I'm, I'm not even going to say I don't know about you because I do know about you. You're all sinners just like I am. And when I sin, or even Satan will do it for history, the old devil will bring up some sin that I've committed even 10, 20, 40 years ago. He'll bring up some sin to try to bring it against me and throw it in my face. Look what you did. You can't be a Christian. Look what you did. But when I tell him that Jesus Christ gave me eternal forgiveness... Satan has to flee. 
You know, I was thinking this afternoon. You know, over in, uh, in the New Testament, the Bible said, Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. The next verse says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When the devil comes and says, Oh, I know what you committed. I know that sin that you did. I know that crime that you committed. I have an eternal promise of forgiveness. See, when God saved me, He did not just save me for sins that I had committed in the past and the sins in the future, I have to go back. At, no, 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 no. When God chose me and when Jesus Christ died for me, Every one of my sins were future. And when God saved me, He didn't save me. Okay, you're saved un up until August the 10th, 1958. After that, you're on your own. No, when God saved me, He saved me eternally. And that's my next point. He saved me eternally. And one of the promises that He made... Is that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Oh, but you don't know what I committed. He didn't put any ifs, ands, or buts. See, one of the great promises that, that God made is that of eternal forgiveness. When Satan comes and says, now, if you haven't confessed it, yeah, Satan's got, got grounds on you there. But when I have confessed it to God and Satan comes and says, oh yeah, look at you, you hypocrite. You know, you go to church, you sit in the pew, you sing like, you're, like you mean it. You get up and you preach and you're nothing more than a hypocrite because I know what you thought yesterday. I don't have to get excited because God's forgiveness was unconditional forever. I'd say that's a pretty good promise. We have the promise of peace with God. Like I said, I really had to cut a lot of things out. Have you ever been at odds with somebody? You know, you're mad at somebody, they're mad at you. You totally dislike them. You don't even want to be around them. And so you avoid them at every opportunity. Before you and I were saved, we were at enmity with God. And like Adam and Eve, we did everything in our power to avoid having to stand and give an account even that we were sinners to God. What did Adam do? Adam and Eve do? They hid. You know what you and I do? We hide. One of the hardest things in the world is for me to admit that I was wrong before God. But before I was saved, I was at war. Even, I, I said this morning, I grew up in church I heard the gospel from around two weeks old all the way up my whole life. But when God began to deal with me in salvation, I did everything I could in my power to hide, to crush it, to resist it. And then one day, God saved me. And now I have peace. I'm not at war anymore. I don't have to worry about, oh, here comes God, quick, hide. Now, because I am at peace with God, I can go boldly to the throne of grace and know that He's going to hear me when I pray. Oh, there's a whole list of 
exceeding great and precious promises. We have the promise of a home in heaven. We have the promise of, well, a long list. Number five, our salvation is great because of its endurance. Do you ever think what it means to have everlasting life? I, I'm learning. You know, somebody, I was talking to someone a week or so ago, and I said, I said you know, old age isn't half the fun I thought it was going to be when I was young. I'm learning that this old body's getting old. Not as old as some of you, but I'm, I'm getting there. I've stood by the casket of many, many, many friends and said farewell in this life. But folks, when my body dies, I started to say when my heart stops, but um, Spencer explained the other day they have to get a magnet to stop my heart because of the pacemaker. But when my spirit leaves this body, even if my heart's continuing to beat, rest assured, I have everlasting life. Everlasting. I'm not going to grow old. I'm not going to get sick. I'm not going to have aches and pains. Because my life is everlasting. I was joking when I was about six years old. I remember a neighbor came over. He was around 18, 19, 20. And here I am, this little bitty teeny weeny kid looking up at this guy, and I thought, oh, cow, he's as old as Methuselah. I can remember thinking, by the wow, when somebody hits 40, why don't they just go ahead and die because they're already, you know, dead by the time they hit 40. You know, it's funny how life changes, isn't it? But because of my salvation, I have everlasting life. Nobody can take it from me. You know, Jesus said that I'm in his hand and I'm secure. He is in the Father's hand. And he said, no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I, I think that's pretty secure. I'm going to have it eternally I can't lose it uh, to those who think you can be saved today and lost tomorrow I, I feel sorry for them I really do because what if you feel dead a nanosecond after you had an evil thought you, you lost your salvation and died before you had a chance to get it back I can't lose mine well, suppose I sin. I can't lose my eternal life. I can't forfeit it. And I can't send it away. Because when God saved me, He gave me everlasting life. What would you pay for a car or even a pair of shoes? Or a mower, or a snowblower, or anything. How much would you pay if you knew that it would never, ever break down and never wear out? How would you pay? Well, let's see. Five dollars for a mower that's going to wear out in six months. Or $50 for one that will never wear out. Why, wow, you'd be an idiot to take the $5 one, wouldn't you? 
when Jesus Christ paid for my salvation, he gave me something that can never wear out. Never. It's everlasting. Last of all, it's great because of what it does to a lost sinner. Please don't ask me to explain this. I don't have the vocabulary. I don't have the words to explain it. But somehow, when people are saved, God removes every speck of filth of sin from them. You know, I, I was thinking about this and people who never see themselves as being really sinners, people who never hate their sin more than life itself, probably aren't saved. I'm not trying to be judgmental. But when I think about what Jesus paid, he didn't pay his life. He didn't suffer his body. He didn't suffer my hell because I was so good that I could just almost make it myself to heaven and he just kind of gave me that little extra nudge. No. No, he saved me because I was dead in trespasses and sins. He saved me because I was steeped in the mire and filth of sin. The Bible often refers to a sinner as an old worm crawling around in the filth and the dirt and the the filth and mud of sin. And unless you understand that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, then you really need to go back and question your salvation. My salvation is precious because I understood. I understood that I was lost I understood that I was on my way to hell. I understood that there was absolutely nothing that I could do to save myself. Growing up in church was worthless. Nothing that I could ever do could ever save me. I realized that if I died without Christ, I would go to hell and I even understood that I deserved to go to hell. Well, I don't think I'm that bad. I did. Now granted, I was young when I was saved. I had never, never, didn't even know what a bar was. Didn't know what a dance hall was. Never had a clue. Didn't understand murder. Didn't... I couldn't even pronounce adultery and fornication, let alone know what they were. I had never done anything bad. I was considered one of the most outstanding young men in, in our area. But when God got a hold of me, I understood I was a sinner. None of the stuff I ever did amounted to a hill of beans. And unless you understand how bad you are, you can't appreciate how great a salvation God gave you. You know, the publican that I preached about a couple of weeks ago, he didn't go to God and say, God, I've done some, you know, I, I told a lie the other day. No, no. He didn't go to God with anything other than have mercy on me, a sinner. Not a good sinner, just a sinner. 
And I think the reason a lot of people don't understand and appreciate how great it is to be saved, what it means to be rescued from the very pits of hell itself, what it means to have your sins forgiven, and for the first time in eons to be at peace with God, they don't understand it because they never experienced it. Psalms chapter 40. David is speaking. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit. Out of the miry clay. And set my feet upon a rock. And established my goings. And he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. David said, when God delivered me from sin, he put a song in my mouth of praise. You know, did you ever wonder how people say they're saved? And they always go around like they're either mad at the world or they're just miserable. Now, I know Christians can backslide and you will be miserable if you're backslidden. But folks, listen, what God did to a lost sinner, he took him, David said, he took me out of a horrible pit took me out of a miry clay, set me on a rock, and he put a song of praise in my mouth. You know, many a broken home has been healed when Jesus entered that home. That's a great salvation that can mend a home, isn't it? Take a drunkard and turn him into a saint. Take a wife beater and turn, her, turn him into a wife lover. Take a child beater and turn him into a parent that demonstrates the love of Christ. Brother, whatever can take a drunk, beating, abusive man and turn him into a child of God has to be a great salvation. Many a broken life has been rescued because God gave them something they couldn't find in this world. I remember one of the first years that I was going to the police academy that's been a few years back, but I've never forgot this lady. She was 